Welcome back, everybody. This is going to be lecture number four. We're talking about reproducibility and replicability, two foundational elements of data science. If you did it and nobody else can verify that you did it, is it even really done? I don't know. We're going to find out today. I'm sure it's uh, right up there with uh, you know trees falling in the forest, at least in data science circles. So um, let's just start off with a couple of course reminder things. Uh, you should complete the course survey if you have not already done it. Uh, if you're one of the clearly relatively large number of people who have participated twice, don't worry. That is actually going to give us another opportunity to chat when we get to the data wrangling part of the course. So. You've, uh, you've given me a good data set. Thank you. Um, we have reading number one is on the docket. Please get to it before next Thursday. And then there's going to be a reading quiz. And then the discussion section will begin in week two. It will be happening right after the reading one is done so that everybody can discuss it in class. All right. <clears throat> Speaking of surveys, uh, you may have noticed there were some surveys in the last lecture, and there will be some in this one too. So uh, there's a, oops, wrong one. Um, all right, I guess I've got to deal with this. I'll fix it really fast on the fly. Nope, can't fix it really fast on the fly. All right, we're just gonna go with it. So um, this is your results. Now you may have noticed there was a before and an after. The same question got asked for to you twice. And in the first case, it was asked before I really lectured much at all about ethics. And in the second case, you were asked the same question after you just heard a big long spiel about various kinds of ethical questions. Now, for this question, social media and online retailers should be allowed to experiment on their users, it was very directly related to the, um, to the topic that we were chatting about with the Facebook study. And, and when we cover that in depth, it is perhaps uh, no real surprise that there is a clear change in how people feel. Okay, so the, uh, the disagreeers, the people who, whoops, we want that. There we go. The people who uh, disagreed that it, they should be allowed to do experiments got bigger by about uh, six, five, six percent in there. And people who uh, strongly disagree also got bigger by five-ish percent. The... Uh, the neutrals shrunk a bit, as did the agreeers. The people that thought it was perfectly great for you to do that shrunk down 5-6%. Now, that's interesting, right? I mean, I guess there was some impact on people's thoughts after they'd listened to all this. And that was kind of the point, is A, we wanted to make you aware of things so you could start to think about these topics that you might not have thought about. And B, we would like to influence you and in how you think about things. But we also want to teach you about data science. And here's a really good thing to show you. Uh, this before uh, example and the after example here, and you can't see the after because it's behind my head. Um, those are not really great ways to present this data. Pie charts are actually pretty crap. They're just pretty colored. So let's, let's look at the same data in a completely different way. This is the kind of chart you may not have seen in the past. It's called a Sankey diagram, after clearly some person named Sankey. And they're meant to show flow. They're meant to show stuff going from one place and arriving in another. And in this case, people starting with one opinion on the pretest when they were shown before the lecture really got into high gear, a question, 
and then what they thought of that same question after the lecture. All right, so first things that might be really apparent is that these kinds of connections that go from one uh, uh, opinion to another very different far away opinion are relatively rare. And what you're seeing here in this kind of a diagram is that the thickness of this connection represents how many people started in agree and ended up in strongly disagree. Okay, so that would be a radical opinion change. And as you might expect, very few people displayed that between the pre-test and the post-test. On the other hand, most people who started in a category disagree, ended up in that same category, and that's represented by the enormous river of flow going that direction. So you can see a diagram like this is made explicitly to show what we're interested in, how people's opinions change. Okay, And by just looking at the fact that are there lots of flows, say, that go one way, relatively thick flows that go down a step? Is that a common thing? Hmm. What about up a step? Are there thick flows that do that? Well, yeah, about the same. Okay, well, what about getting to what the pie chart shows us, which is in the beginning, disagree had this much percentage of people in it, and it got bigger, there were more disagreeers by the end of it. Well, why is that? What, what came in there? Well, a lot of neutrals went this way. That pumped it up, and some strongly disagreeers went the other way. They came more neutral in their opinion. Hmm. And some disagreeers left disagree and decided to strongly disagree. So there is overall clear enlargement of the strongly disagrees and the disagrees. The pattern of how that went is not really clear. There's maybe like some flow towards more neutral positions, right, that we can see. And there also seems to be some flow towards disagree. So there were seemed to be two large classes of people, people who moderated their responses, right, like agreeers to neutrals and disagreeers to neutrals. And maybe those are the people who got confused, right? They're just like, I don't know, I'm, I feel on the fence. Maybe I should present this stuff better. And then on the flip side, there does seem to be some motion towards the more disagreeable side because the clear enlargement here. All right, so that's a Sankey diagram. That's an example of a data visualization you probably have not been familiar with before you came into this class. It's also an example of how data visualizations are very powerful in how they can help us both communicate information and represent complicated topics and give you something to communicate with. All right, um, just to follow up a few interesting more results in the other questions. Um, these are interesting because the first question was very directly related to what we were talking about, the social media stuff, Facebook study. These other two questions, I spent little time on them in the case of uh, is it okay to use data for that I find on the internet for my research project? I barely say anything about it, and to be honest, I think I any movement here might have been because I I think one time I gave a biased response in how I was presenting it when I didn't mean to. So, but it is interesting because there is more of a flow towards disagree in this guy, and also some flows towards neutral. Uh, whoops, not that one. Here, agree to neutral and uh, a little bit of disagree towards neutral, but more agree towards neutral. So there does seem to be a shift downwards. Um, but it's interesting because I didn't really talk about this topic very much. Even more so, I said nothing about policing genetic databases. Uh, and interestingly, there is a bit less flow in this diagram to my eyes than the other questions. Um, 
So there is a lot of uh, switchers going from agree and neutral into disagree is like the only major systemic thing that I really saw. Um, so there seems to have been some negative change, some feelings that generically things that you might consider ethical violations in some framework, maybe we should be less likely to approve of them. But it's interesting because I wasn't talking about this at all, and any effect on people's behavior must therefore have just been a kind of contamination from the fact that we were discussing ethics at all, right? Because we certainly weren't discussing these ethics. FYI, we did have a good discussion about this stuff in my office hours uh, on Wednesday, I think. Um, and if you're interested in that, you could check out the recording on uh, Canvas since all that stuff's recorded. All right. There's a little bit of data you guys gave us, very interesting, and it gives you an idea of the kind of work we do as data scientists. We collect figures, numbers, and we try to tease if there's any kind of information out of that. We have to be careful, especially with something like the diagrams I just presented you, because we don't really have a strong idea of how these effects came to be. We have a set of measurements that were made, and maybe they're not ideal measurements. We have to try to interpret them as best we can and dig deeper to better understand if there's truth there or if there was just a misperception, okay? And that is in large measure what we're gonna talk about today. Because when somebody does an analysis and they think they found something interesting, you need to communicate it and send it out into the world so other people know. And then to make sure that you're not just full of BS, other people in the world are going to try to do the same thing you did. And that's great, we want that. We want people trying to make sure that they can reproduce and replicate the different things that have been tried in the past. Because people do make mistakes. Random chance does happen and something looks in a given experiment like a really big important effect. And then the next time you run the same experiment, it doesn't come up the same way. And, and chance is chance, it just happens. Okay, so let's talk more about this. And we're gonna define really what constitutes reproducible data science, because you want other people to be able to see the same things you do and get their hands dirty in the analysis so that they can verify by their own work the things that you are saying. Um, we're gonna talk about the challenges and limitations and uh, identify some cases of where your own cognitive biases may predispose you to uh, making things that are not re replicable. All right. In the end, you've probably seen the scientific method. You know, I really have to fix this. I apologize that we're gonna end up in a um, situation. Oh, magic is here to meow and entertain us while I fix this. go. All right. Brilliant. Magic, thank you for your contributions. I'm sure they can hear your meows. All right. So what I was saying, the scientific method, right? Scientific method is the, uh, it's, you, I'm sure you've seen this from school age onwards, right? This idea that there is this, uh, this pathway from observation to questioning to, here, magic, thanks kid. And let's just give him the view. Cat butt. All right, back to work. Uh, observation to questioning to forming some sort of research, uh, around the question, getting some background, making a hypothesis or guess, doing an experiment, analyzing it, and then you're at the end, right? This is, this is how we're always told it works. It's just this path, right? Very easy, we just do it, no problems. In reality, of course, it doesn't work that way. It's more like, 
uh, sometimes we start by reading things and then go right to an experiment that we don't know anything about and then eventually there's a question that's formed and then we have to realize that uh, we we need some sort of hypothesis but we need to check that out we go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and then we go ah we don't really know what's going on and we head over here and we do a lot of reading and ah it's like days in the library and it still doesn't make any sense and then i go back and i'm like oh i have this old data what does this mean all right well if i reanalyze it does it oh do i have a hypothesis oh maybe i have a hypothesis okay let's do some more experiments and now it's time to analyze and Ah, uh, the instrument broke. Arr. That is my, my very sad scientist. All right, that's the real scientific method. Um. So yeah. Data science is no different. <laughs> um, so they're going to tell us that uh, the scientific process is the same as science and data science. And that, of course, means that this beautiful forward arrow is going to look a lot more like uh, you ask a question and jump right into an experiment and analyzing it and then run back over here and back and forth. And then you're like, oh, I don't understand this at all. I have to do some research. And then you jump back over here to some more experiments. And then uh, somebody asks you to present what you're doing to the uh, whole group and somebody else comes back and says, no, you're asking the wrong question. And in the end, we have this one. All right. So it can be frustrating. There is this sense that there is an iterative cycle of things that go on here, right? The, uh, the process is not this straightforward thing but it is still fundamentally science. Okay, I want to stress that. Even though it's much more complex a process with more setbacks than you were led to believe when you were in junior high, it is also the case that this is our method. The scientific process is the science and data science. And the iteration is a necessary part of how this whole thing works. Okay, you need to uh, get your hands dirty and by getting your hands dirty, you're going to find out new things. And by finding out new things, you will make connections with people who will offer feedback and help you formulate questions. And in the end, you'll realize that you had the whole wrong end of it for a really long time, and you'll have to start over. But that is still forward progress. And it's the best tool we have for getting to the truth, as messy as it is. All right. So. Um, relevant to today, during the survey, you all figured out, uh, you guys gave us a little tip off on which topics were you already at least familiar enough with to talk about what they were, right? Um, and apropos today's discussion, reproducibility, go away, I want the highlighter, reproducibility and replicability are here. And uh, they're running in the low teens in terms of percent of people who know what the heck we're talking about. So I guess today is going to be a banner day for everybody. On a related note, version control, which is right below it, is even less well known. And boy, let me tell you, you all are about to get real familiar with version control because one of the keys to making your work reproducible by other people is version control. It is a anybody who works with computers in a detailed way, and especially in teams, but even alone, making sure that you are not set up in that thing that you have done in the past, right? You were in high school and you were writing a report with, uh, you know, and you were like, you know, this is final report, draft one, final report, draft two, final report, draft oh no, I deleted it, right? And then it's like, and the, by the end of it, the final name is final report, really final, no, actually final this time. No, this is really the last one dot doc, right? That's the BS that version control deals with, is looking at all the changes you made to a project along the way 
if you find that you went down a wrong path, version control lets you go back. If somebody accidentally deleted something, it lets you recover it. If you're working with multiple people and you're working in separate sections of the work and you need to combine it at the end so that it all makes sense as one thing, whether that's a program or a document, version control. Okay, so we'll be talking more about that in, I believe, the next lecture, actually. But right now, I just wanted to give you the pricey. Um, FYI, your low teens is consistent with uh, fall 2019. They, they looked very similar to you in that sense. So it seems like reproducibility and replicability is a low knowledge thing. Well, let's try to remedy that. So what is it? So this paper by Prasad, Peng, and Leek is, uh, is maybe the go-to because it defines what reproducibility and replicability are in hardcore formal math, all right? And to put it in not formal math, but formal language, it's doing exactly the same analysis with the same data and the same software, but a different person at the keyboard, okay? That is what a reproducible experiment is. Now wait, you say, that sounds super easy, right? I mean, I, I just hand my software and my data to somebody and they can type run and it's good, right? I think you all have tried to install software on a computer before. How'd that go for you? You like, Maybe you got a new laptop and all the stuff you'd been using wasn't on there and then suddenly you couldn't make this program work because it needed like a really old driver and you were like, ah, like how many things from uh, when you first entered high school do you still have the ability to open those things, whatever it was, maybe if it was your favorite video game, right? Maybe the console that your video game was on is now broken and you can't play that game. Right? So uh, software and time marches on. Being able to even run old software can be a huge problem. Uh, the code may be available, but the data got lost, right? Or that was not documented how to actually get the data into the program. And so you have the data and you have the program, but nobody wrote down how to put the two together. These are all issues that we find out. Um, so as we mentioned, uh, you know, sometimes you don't get the data at all, or you get a copy of uh, version four and you needed version 12, right? Um, code went AWOL. Nobody told you how to actually make this whole thing work. Uh, you know, all kinds of things, software version issues, library version issues, operating system version issues. Right. It's just it's as soon as you work in computer science -y stuff for any amount of time, you realize there's this huge issue of keeping things running. And eventually it all comes crashing down. Don't know what it's going to be this year, but it's going to be some year. So you've got to in order to make things reproducible, you have to make a strong effort and it isn't necessarily easy. So um, as a data scientist, it is indeed your responsibility to address all these, not just in the beginning, but throughout your project, in fact. Um, this is not something that just, you know, you, you deal with it once and it's done. No, sadly. Um, and it gets even worse when you are, if you are a data scientist working for a big company, say you're working for some giant sales firm which has enormous amounts of data continually changing. There's always an update to the data coming out, like all this sales data and all these, you know, marketing surveys. Okay, so you create some analysis on Sunday, March 14th. Somebody wants to recreate it on October the 3rd. In a big production environment, this the data may actually be just a continual flow. You may not even be able to say exactly what moment in the data 
you gathered up all the information necessary for the analysis. And if you don't know exactly what data went into the analysis, it can get pretty hairy um, in terms of reproducing it, right? Um, many times the, you know, in an environment like this, you also have, uh, you know, not even people who don't even necessarily care about having date stamps in things, just that they need to make sure that it, it uh, works at the moment, not that it works five months later. Okay, along those lines, actually, just as I was sitting down to eat breakfast this morning, I saw a tweet that said exactly this, right? So Shreya is a, a, a machine learning DevOps kind of person. So if you're not familiar, uh, DevOps is a, a, a computer science thing for people who keep both development and operation stuff all at the same time. They are the people who both enable the development of new machine learning stuff, but at the same time make sure that all these pipelines that feed the data monster are operational and uh, making sure that they are maintained. And this is something which is an active process, right? Not a, oh, it's done, I can sit back and relax. Okay, so what you see with this kind of thing is that she is highly concerned that not just is it, you know, that you have to keep track of your code, but that you've got to also keep track of your data. This is what I was saying. You may need to version models and artifacts. You know, there's, there's maybe in a streaming environment, there's extra problems both because it's hard to know exactly which data came in. And it's even worse than that, that just in terms of the computational aspect of doing control, version control. You need to do operations that are fine when you have a couple of megabytes of code on your desktop. They are impossible when you're dealing with terabytes and exabytes of data that are flowing continually. It becomes very hard to do the operations necessary to do version control, to difference between versions. Okay, so that gives you an idea. Reproducibility ain't easy, but yet it's still your responsibility because an analysis isn't true unless somebody else really knows that it is and isn't just a made up story that's hidden behind your words. So we haven't been always reproducible. There are some things that are kind of systemic, okay? Like things involved in Nobody really has a mechanism to do peer review for code the same way we do for academic papers in these highfalutin journals, right? Um, many times uh, there's no incentive to actually publish the code, right? That's changing our systems and structures, enabling us to, uh, to make sure that people operate differently in the future. Um, so there's simple changes, but because you have to inter you have to make those changes at a society level. I'll argue they're not actually quite so simple as uh, this makes out to be, okay? We have lack of literacy fundamentally in statistical and computational things. And, um, you know, that can be uh, fixed with education. You can be part of that as a data scientist. So. It's no longer acceptable to be anything but reproducible in our field, okay? In anything computery, data sharing is required. Sharing code is easy. The technology is there, okay? If you are, say, an economist, okay, and you're taking this data science course just because you want to do data-y things in economics, in that field, I don't know. I'm not an economist, but I vaguely have heard that, you know, data sharing is still not really the thing that's always done because that's kind of uh, your, your treasure and it can be hard to access. And I find that some fields that are very uh, intensive in labor and getting the data can be much more uh, unlikely to share the data, all right? But in, if you're publishing computer stuff, if you're working in the computer world, it's going to be 
de rigueur. It's going to be required. Okay, here's a quick little quiz for you. So Faram shares the results of her analysis with the data science team, and she provides the team access to the data, the code, and the software versions she has used for making this analysis. Do you think her work is reproducible? So right about now, you should be getting a pop-up window, and uh, it will take you to a Google form where you can very quickly answer. So in the, in the news, you will have seen stuff perhaps about the replicability crisis. You may also have seen stuff about the reproducibility crisis, but they're not the same thing. <laughs> and oftentimes when people say reproducibility, especially in like some news article in 2014, what they really mean is replicability. We have been talking about reproducibility, being able to just run the same analysis on the same data. It's just that you hand over the keyboard to somebody else to get their hands dirty and see that, yes, indeed, this is how it works. Okay, so we're going to make a distinction. Reproducibility is the same data, the same code, the same software, different person. Replicability is a replica. It is making a facsimile of the same experiment. It is re-performing the experiment and therefore getting new data, but in the same idea, the same genre, the same, as much as possible the same, right, as it was done the first time. So uh, you almost certainly have different people collecting the data you are probably doing it at a new site. You have uh, the procedures in front of you and you're gonna follow the procedures manual on how to do this. But hopefully you even have the same software to apply, but at least they're collecting new data. So new hands on something. Um, so this has been in the news for a while, for the last almost five years, in fact, it's been clear that especially in a couple of fields, in medicine uh, and in uh, social science have been the two biggies which have gotten the most attention, okay? Uh, in both these fields at various points, it was okay for somebody to run studies frequently. Just keep running a study, running a study, running a study. Oh, I got one that worked okay, my study with 12 people, this is an interesting new effect. I know it's only 12 people, but you should check it out. All right, there's some problems there. Um, one is that they were running study after study after study, and they would only publish things that looked neat. This is called the file drawer problem, and it works like this. If you... Um, if things turn out interesting just due to chance, if there's never any interesting effect there, it's just the roll of the dice, and sooner or later you will roll the dice snake eyes 10 times in a row. A highly unlikely event, right? Rolling a two again and again and again and again. Not gonna happen very often all in a row, but it does happen if you keep rolling the dice, okay? So that kind of not actually right, just looks like it's right by chance, is called a false positive. It's something that just happens due to chance. It isn't really a positive effect that you have found in whatever your experiment is. Okay, so if you run experiments over and over and over quickly, cheaply, on small numbers of people, it's easy to get this. And at one point, social science and medicine were both very guilty of operating in this way, okay? So many of the classics of the genre, these big name things that are in textbooks, these effects, have at various times not replicated. Okay, so for instance, this 2005 paper by uh, John Ioannidis is got quite a provocative title. Um, so 
using a bunch of statistics and a simulation, he was able to establish that fundamentally it's highly unlikely that so many of these research findings that are published as a new thing are actually a new thing. It is what I was just describing, a false positive due to chance. Um, and there is a variety of other papers out there where people have had a really hard time replicating, right? Redoing the experiment with new people, but the same experiment. And uh, it follows on from all that work. So this became a very famous paper, bringing a lot of interest in it. And um, maybe a little bit of, uh, I don't know what to call it, uh, bad karma involved that um, there's no data in this paper. <laughs> it's not actually replicable. It's just a uh, paper of conjecture and mathematical simulation. And the simulation itself is not a published piece of software. Okay. Let's move onwards to actually things where people have tried to replicate very important effects in social science. So in the last several years, we've had a number of very big efforts where dozens of labs have cooperated together to try to replicate the big effects in those textbooks. So for instance, this one went after some very classic psychology experiments like the, um, the sunk costs of a ticket. So let's say you have a ticket to a football game and it's a blizzard outside right now. Do you want to go sit in the snow and the cold and watch the game? Well, if you bought the ticket with your own money, it's a sunk cost. It is something which you've already paid for and you're not getting that money back. So people who have actually paid for the ticket, it turns out in an experiment, are much more likely to actually go make themselves miserable in the cold. Whereas if somebody gave you the ticket for free and you didn't have a sunk cost in it, then you would be unlikely, more unlikely to go sit in the blizzard. All right. So there are very, very interesting basic effects here. And it turns out that in this work, 13 basic science, uh, we call them gold star things in textbooks, uh, the vast majority of them did replicate. So this line here is the, the null hypothesis, the idea that everything's just chance, okay? And each one of these lines is one of these experiments being replicated by dozens and dozens of people. Each one of these little dots is one of the sub-experiments that somebody in Omaha did that one and somebody in Japan did that one, okay? And what you see is, in these little bars, is the statistical uh, estimate of how big an effect it really was. And anytime these uh, big circles with the little feelers on the end of them, the, uh, the error bars is what those are called, anytime those error bars don't overlap with a zero, it's a replication in the sense that some effect was observed. The problem lies down here, okay? So this X is the original paper that reported this effect. It is a relatively strong effect up here. But this is where all the replications were. And while we're not overlapping zero with that whisker bar of the error bars, it's, uh, it's not nearly as strong as the original effect. And you'll see that a few times in here, the original effects being much more strong than the replications. And there's a few that are the opposite, where the replications show a much bigger effect than the original paper. So, yes, most of these things replicated. Another one was more recent in uh, Nature and Science going after a bunch of uh, social science things. And this one didn't replicate quite as many. So only the studies in blue showed significance showed that they were beyond the null and this stuff wasn't just due to chance. So this was about half. The previous one was uh, more like 80%. So this is the crisis people are talking about. 
if you can only replicate about half of these top journal things, then replicability is in crisis. And it, yeah, so this is where I was chatting with you earlier that journalists often use the word reproducibility when what they really mean is replicable. I ask you again, what is the difference between replicability and reproducibility? I'm waiting. Yes, you are right. Reproducibility just means that somebody handed you all the data and the software and you can just rerun the analysis. Replicability means somebody got their hands dirty with a new experiment. Both of them are going to be new people in a new location trying to do the same thing. Okay, so replicability is harder than reproducibility by definition because those underlying data are different and data are always full of random junk, right? They're full of randomness in the sense that um, measurements are randomly corrupted by error. They're full of randomness in the sense that uh, somebody messed up and mislabeled something. It's inevitable, okay? They're full of randomness in the sense that even the physical processes that physicists, the hardest of hard scientists measure, have statistical distributions, okay? So imagine you're carrying out a study here. You've got look at some sort of uh, deal where you're trying to look at plant growth and you, are, uh, you have your magic compound and it makes your plants grow 50% more. So one group sets out to reproduce your findings, a second group sets out to replicate, right? Because you're a great scientist, you have done the dirty work. You've made sure that all the code and the data and all the things needed to run this again are public, wrapped up in a nice Docker file. It's beautiful, man. We'll get into Docker maybe some, sometime soon. Um, and within an hour or so, the first group has reproduced your results. And they're also, even more than that, they're able to play around in the in the gears and in the machinery underneath your analysis and really understand because they've got your code what all the switches and dials mean okay on the other hand the other group the second group takes your very precise methods sets up the experiment in the exact same way and they carry it out and they have to wait the several months for all the plants to grow but then the second group gets their own data, analyzes it, and finds your super awesome growth compound has increased growth of plants 10%, not 50. So here's a quiz for you. Please click on the Google Forms link. Uh, in the initial experiment, growth was 50%. In the replication, growth did increase, but it's by 10%. Do you think the study replicated? There's a second condition. In this condition, the growth was increased by 49%. The second study that replicated you now didn't do 10% growth, they found 49%. Do you think the study replicated? All right. So how do we define replicability? Well, um, do the values really have to be exactly the same? Or is it just that they have to be in the same direction? OK. As long as it's in the same direction and bigger than 0, is it still a good thing? Right? So the measurement can be obtained with the stated precision by a different team using the same measurement procedure, the same measuring system under the same operating conditions in the same or a different location, but do we care about the overall size of the effect? So I will argue at least a little bit, okay? One of the things that you'll have to get a better understanding of statistics for is that there are things which are true, provably in the sense by statistics say, yes, there's an effect. 
but their effect sizes are so tiny we don't care, right? If you get a uh, treatment which raises the height of the average person in the United States by 1 20th of an inch by less than a millimeter, is that an important treatment? I mean, it's a treatment that has been demonstrated to work because it's statistically significant. There is a 1 20th of an inch growth on average, but it does not translate into a practically interesting effect. And that's one thing I will argue is that a replication has to be not just trivial. It has to be a replication with an effect size big enough people should care. Okay. So why would a study failure fail to replicate? Maybe the, uh, the whole thing wasn't real. Maybe it was just a false positive. It was a random roll of the dice that happened to come up snake eyes 10 times in a row. This happens. It's not bad science. It's just the nature of doing a lot of experiments. Okay, another thing could be sources of measurement error, uh, variable finding that, you know, this, is a, this was a real effect in 1983, but culture has changed and that is no longer a real effect. Okay, um, it could be a different population. This is only true for people who, uh, you know, grew up undernourished and there's fewer undernourished people now. Okay, so there are all these things, reasons why it's not, um, it's not evil, it's not somebody meant to do it, it's just what happens. Okay, but as a data scientist, it is your responsibility to try to make sure it doesn't happen to anything that you do. Okay, you need to be the one that makes sure that the information is out there, that somebody could replicate your study and accurately report your findings. That is kind of your professional uh, honor on the line. All right, so let's summarize. We recognize that there's you know variations in terms, but we're gonna make sure that we understand that reproducibility is that you just keep all the same data and you just make sure that somebody can take that data, use the same software and make the same analysis work. And most importantly, not just work, but be able to play with it and understand the workings underneath because they have the stuff right there. So replicability is the act of actually repeating the entire experiment, gathering new data. But of course, using it at least very, very similar, if not identical methods. Of course, there's an issue about what identical can possibly really mean when it's done by different people in different places and times. So uh, we're just going to kind of show a few more ideas about what has happened when this stuff has gone awry. Um, a rather famous incident was uh, when somebody ran a very influential study that generated a very big uh, following in the TED Talk circles, people who love to watch YouTube. And uh, it was all done when that world that we were talking about earlier, where small numbers of people in an experiment were okay, as were large numbers of experiments until you found something nice on your fishing expedition, right? And we talked about how that kind of thing, when you do lots and lots of experiments and you just throw away the ones that don't work, and each experiment is small, so it's easy for random effects to become a big deal, that those can easily generate these false positives. So, um, you know, somebody who made a huge influential career being a kind of talk star to business people and so forth uh, ended up in a lot of trouble as people right about the time realized that one of the things that had made her a star uh, was essentially the same kinds of shoddy research practices that had been the normal in, say, pre-2010. Okay, everybody did research this way before people really started to realize the statistical problem behind this kind of irreproducible research. Okay, um, so I, I don't want to go deep into the details, but fundamentally, this life hack that she was offering business people to make them feel more powerful was just to stand in a particular way. 
like this. And that standing in this power pose would yield in you a feeling of more power and that in turn would yield other people to see you as more powerful. So once again, as Magic is demonstrating with his meows, it turns out that that's not a replicable experiment. And many people have, you know, realized this and published it. But at the time, everybody at piled on and attacked her because it was like a, you know, she was one of the more famous people out there is how I feel like that one went down. So she was uh, front and center on the takedowns. So moral of the story, if it looks like a unicorn too good to possibly be true, maybe it isn't. Another way that science kind of falls down is, uh, oops, I just realized you didn't get to see my unicorn slide because I am not managing my camera well. If it looks like a unicorn, right? This is the unicorn test. If you find a unicorn, return to your data until you're fully convinced that this is a real unicorn. And you better use extra checks because unicorns need extra checks. Okay, so a very famous experiment from uh, the beginning of the 20th century is Millikan's oil drop experiment. Back when physics was done with the kind of stuff you could find in your garage. Okay, Millikan was using this apparatus to try to measure the charge of an electron, of a single individual electron. And he came up with a measurement which is really, really tiny, 10 to the minus 19th. Okay, it turns out he wasn't that far off, certainly not orders of magnitude, but he was wrong. And he got it wrong because he had this incorrect value for the viscosity of air. And that messed up his, his uh, calculations quite badly. Okay? So what's really cool is that when you look at the history of these measurements, so Millikan did this experiment, and then the next person did it, and the next person did it. And each time, the measurement from Millikan here, right, is going up. And it's not going up dramatically. It's not like suddenly, oh, we're up top there. It's slowly over time asymptoting a little bit closer to the real value. Okay. So why did it take them literally decades to get up over to here, right? Well, it's a thing scientists are kind of ashamed of because it's apparent that people basically disbelieved themselves when they found an, a value that was a little too high, right? If your number was close to Millikan's value, people didn't look so hard. They're like, okay, that must be right. This was my expectation. But on the other hand, if it was a really, really far off value, it must have been wrong, right? And you just check yourself. You're like, that's not what I expected. I don't think it should work that way. And you'll nitpick and find ways to disbelieve that result, okay? If a result confirms your previous beliefs, you are likely to accept it without nitpicking it, to let it just kind of, okay, I believe that. That's exactly what I expected. And in that way, you don't check yourself before you wreck yourself, right? You don't look at the thing and realize you made a mistake and that value of the viscosity of air is off by a factor of four, right? So in conclusion, what we have to know as we are practicing data scientists is that we have to balance a very difficult problem. As we're doing experiments, doing analyses, we're finding out suggested truths, right? Our analysis leads us to think this way. What if conventional wisdom is that way? Okay. If conventional wisdom and the result of your analysis are different, you have to decide where you believe truth lies. And in that way, we have to know that if something is too good to be true, it probably is. 
And yet at the same time, conventional wisdom is a confirmation bias. It is this lack of us checking our own assumptions that lets dumb things in our results get the better of us and takes three decades to get to the true measurement of the charge of an electron iteratively inching closer each time. Okay, so this is the balance, right? And one of the key points here is that in both of these, the solution is to check yourself. If you think, oh, that's the answer I expected, stop, take a deep breath, count to 10, close your eyes and think, how could all of my work have been wrong? What are the ways that I have failed previously doing experiments or analyses like this? Okay, let me check and make sure I did plug in the machine. Let me check and make sure nobody accidentally entered a zero when there should have been a one, okay? Always double check, triple check, more check. That's one way to prevent yourself from confirmation bias if you check even the things that you expect to be right when they come out right. Write tests to verify the things you assume to be true. The unicorns also you need to check by checking them. If something looks particularly amazing, you probably need a particularly high level of double checking and quadruple checking. Okay, well, that is all I had for you today. I hope you all have a lovely fun day. Get some rest. I know I am looking forward to it, and I will see you at the next lecture. Bye.